Lewis theory and Lewis symbols are most commonly applied to determining the structure of covalent compounds. Molecules built out of Lewis symbols are known as Lewis structures. And at their simplest, these structures show how valence electrons are shared to form covalent bonds. This reaction shows the formation of a chlorine molecule from two individual atoms of chlorine. Each atom contains seven valence electrons. If they each share one of those valence electrons, though, with the other atom, they now can each claim access to a full set of eight. The electrons shared between them can now be counted as part of the valence set for the first chlorine, as well as for the second chlorine. To simplify drawing Lewis structures for covalent compounds, we often replace that shared pair of electrons with a dash. Unshared electrons are kept as dots in the Lewis structure and are called lone pairs. Two shared pairs between atoms is known as a double bond and represented by two dashes. Three shared pairs is known as a triple bond and represented by three dashes. The octet rule is our guiding principle in how electrons are shared. Each atom in a molecule should have eight valence electrons, including shared pairs. Now there are exceptions to this rule, of course, and the first and most common exception is hydrogen. Hydrogen is in the first row of the periodic table, so it's actually trying to fill the first energy level. And the maximum number of electrons that can fit into that first energy level is actually just two, the same as the noble gas helium. So this is why hydrogen actually is considered to have a full valence set with two electrons. Here we see several Lewis structures for some very simple molecules. And you'll notice that for these molecules, you can use the unpaired electrons on the Lewis symbols for each element as your guide to see how bonds are actually formed. For example, in this first molecule, hydrogen has one unpaired electron, bromine has one as well. Those are the electrons that the two atoms are going to share. And they're the ones that become the single bond in the final molecule. In the second example, we have two hydrogen atoms, each with one unpaired electron, and one sulfur, which has two unpaired electrons. Each of those hydrogen atoms are actually going to share that unpaired with one of the unpaired on sulfur. So we end up in the final molecule with our two hydrogen atoms having two single bonds with the sulfur in the middle. And finally, on nitrogen, each nitrogen has five valence electrons, and that gives them three unpaired electrons on the Lewis symbol for the neutral element. When two nitrogen atoms come together, they just share those unpaired electrons. And since there's three of them on each, that results in a triple bond. So there's our final molecule with the triple bond. For more complicated molecules and ions, it will be easier to follow a step-by-step -step procedure to figure out the Lewis structure. So I'll go over the steps here, and then we'll do some examples. The first one is to determine the total number of valence electrons in the molecule. This means figuring out how many valence electrons each atom brings to the molecule and adding them together. If it's a polyatomic ion that you're figuring out the structure for, you do need to also account for the charge in that total valence electron count. So if it's a cation, you subtract one electron for each positive charge. If it's an anion, you add one electron for each negative charge. Second, you draw a skeleton structure of what the molecular ion should be by arranging the atoms around a central atom. If it's not clear which atom in the molecule should be the central one, it's usually the least electronegative. Then you draw single bonds between the central atom and each terminal atom and subtract those from the electron total. You start distributing the remaining valence electrons first as lone pairs on the terminal atoms, making sure that each one has a full octet, with the exception of hydrogen, of course. If there are valence electrons left over, then you start putting them on the central atom. 
When you run out of that total number of valence electrons, you've placed all of those, then you start making decisions about whether or not to place double or triple bonds so that all atoms end up with a full octet of electrons. So let's do some examples. Here I have four molecules. Some of them are neutral molecules, some of them are actually ions. And we're going to start with the first step for each of them, determining the total number of valence electrons. So we'll begin with silane, SiH4. So we figure out the number of valence electrons for each of the atoms within that molecular formula. Silicon is in column 14 of the periodic table. That means it has four valence electrons. Hydrogen, of course, is from column one and has one valence electron. I have four of them, however, so that means that we have four valence electrons total from those hydrogens. We add those numbers together, and for the entire molecule, we have eight valence electrons that we can distribute between bonds and lone pairs. Now we'll do the same thing for our CHO2 molecule, this is the formate ion. Carbon has four valence electrons. It's from group 14 of the periodic table. Hydrogen has one. And oxygen is in column 16, so that means six valence electrons. We have two of them in the formula, so we multiply that by two to get 12 valence electrons. The last piece is the charge. This is a polyatomic anion with a negative one charge. That means we have to add one valence electron to account for that charge. We add all of those together and we get 18 valence electrons total for this molecule. Let's do the same thing for the NO plus. This is a cation. So this time, nitrogen comes from column 15, five valence electrons. Oxygen, column 16, six valence electrons. The positive charge means that we've lost an electron. So we actually subtract one out. It's the same as adding negative one. The sum of all of these, including that negative one for the positive charge, is 10 valence electrons. And last but not least, we'll deal with oxygen difluoride, OF2. So oxygen has six valence electrons. Fluorine is from column 17, so seven valence electrons. We have two of them, so that's 14 from the fluorines. We add them together and we get 20 valence electrons total to distribute. So our next step is to draw a skeleton structure of the molecule or ion, arranging atoms around a central atom. When you look at a molecular formula, there are a few tips for picking out what's going to be your central atom. Generally, if you have a formula that has only one of a certain element, that one is going to be in the center. Another good rule of thumb is that whenever you see hydrogen as one of your atoms, it's never, ever a central atom. It has to be on the outside. So we'll put hydrogen around our silicon as our central atom. We then connect each of those outside atoms, another term for that is a terminal atom, to the central atom. So each hydrogen gets connected with one dash, which represents two shared electrons. Okay, so that's our silane molecule. Now let's do our formate ion. We do have two elements with just one atom in the formula. But remember, hydrogen is never a central atom, so that means we have to pick carbon. Another way of knowing that carbon is the central atom is that it's the least electronegative. So that means it's the most likely to share electrons. More electronegative atoms, like oxygen, don't like to share, so they're not likely to be in the center. So we'll place carbon in the center. We'll place our hydrogen on one side and an oxygen on two other sides. And then we'll connect each of those terminal atoms with a single line representing a uh, one pair of shared electrons. So our next molecule, the NO cation, this is easy. We've only got two atoms, so there we go. N connected to O, 
and a dash. Now, a convention associated with anion and cation formulas for Lewis structures is that uh, we actually place them in brackets usually and put the charge outside of them just to indicate that in order to build this Lewis structure, you had to either gain or lose an electron. So you're going to see that in some of the later slides. Let's do our last structure and we'll do the skeleton structure for oxygen difluoride. All right, so oxygen we have just one of, that means it's most likely the central atom. It's also less electronegative than fluorine. Fluorine's the most electronegative element on the periodic table. So this becomes pretty simple. We put our oxygen in the center, we put a fluorine on each side, and we connect with a single dash. So here are the skeletal structures again, drawn in a little bit more neatly than I did on the last slide. What I've also done on this slide is subtracted out the electrons that were used up in those single dashes that I drew in. So for selene, for example, I drew in four dashes, four single bonds between each of the hydrogens and the silicon. Each dash represents two electrons, so two times four bonds means that I used eight valence electrons. I subtract that out from my total that I started with, and that actually leaves me with zero valence electrons left. What that ultimately means is that I have no electrons left to do my third step, which is to distribute remaining electrons as lone pairs on the terminal, terminal atoms, with the exception of hydrogen. So it's fine that I don't have any electrons left because all of my terminal atoms are hydrogen and they don't get any extra anyway. So that's all good. For my next molecule, for the formate ion, I placed three single dashes, so three bonds times two electrons each. So that becomes six valence electrons that I subtract out from 18. That gives me 12 valence electrons left. I'm going to place those as lone pairs. And I'm going to only place them on the oxygen because, of course, hydrogen won't accept any lone pairs. It already has its two. So I'm going to do this the best that I can. One, two, one, two, one, two. Okay, that's six placed on that first oxygen, and one, two, one, two, one, two. That's six placed on the second oxygen. So 12 valence electrons total have just been placed. Okay, now let's move on to the NO plus ion. So here I have eight electrons to place. That's actually not enough to put lone pairs on both the nitrogen and the oxygen. So what I'm going to do is just distribute it as evenly as I can between the nitrogen and oxygen. So I'll put two, uh, two sets of pairs on the nitrogen. Um, so that's four and two on the oxygen. So that's eight total. I cannot place more electrons than that because I do not have more electrons to place. You cannot exceed that amount of electrons after you've subtracted out the number of bonds, okay? You cannot exceed the total number of valence electrons that you started with. Okay, so let's move on to oxygen difluoride. Now I have 16 electrons to place. This is more than enough. I'm going to start placing lone pairs just on the fluorines. We always start with the terminal atoms first. So one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Believe it or not, those are lone pairs that are supposed to be attached to those fluorine atoms. And since I'm just doing the fluorines first, I've a uh, I've placed six on each fluorine. That's 12 lone pair electrons total. So before I can do the fourth step, I have to figure out how many valence electrons I have left to place on the central atom. So that means I subtract out the number of lone pair electrons from my total valence electrons for each molecule. In selene, I didn't place any lone pair electrons, uh, so I don't change this calculation at all. It's still at zero electrons. For formate, I place 12 lone pair electrons, six on each oxygen atom. I subtract that out from my total and include in that subtraction process, of course, the number of electrons that were in the bonds that I placed between the oxygen and hydrogens in the carbon. So combining all of that, 
leaves me with zero electrons. I have no more electrons to place in that central atom. For the NO cation, I placed only eight valence electrons because I knew I only had eight to place. So I subtract those uh, lone pair electrons from my total and I have zero electrons. It's only for oxygen difluoride that I have electrons left that I can place on the central atom. So I placed 12 lone pairs, six on each fluorine. I subtract that out from my total and I'm left with four electrons that I can put on that oxygen. So I'm gonna draw these lone pairs in here as best I can. One, two, one, two. Now for each of our molecules, we have placed all of our valence electrons. Our totals are down to zero. The last step is to look and make sure that everything that wants a full octet has a full octet of valence electrons. So that means everything except hydrogen should have eight electrons around it, either as lone pairs or as shared electrons in a bond. If it doesn't, then what we need to do is figure out a way to share some of those lone pair electrons to give each atom that full octet. All right, so for selene, we're all set. Hydrogen has two, silicon has eight, everything is happy. That is the correct Lewis structure. For the formate ion, however, hydrogen is happy. The oxygens are happy. They have their six lone pairs and two shared in the bonds, so they have a full set of eight, but carbon is not. Carbon only has six electrons around it in those three bonds. So in order to give carbon its full set of eight, one of those oxygens is gonna have to share. And that's exactly what happens. We take one of the lone pairs from one of the oxygens, and it could be either oxygen, and we move it so that it's actually shared as another bond between carbon and oxygen. This is what it looks like, okay, after that uh, electron pair has been moved. We've got a double bond between the carbon and the oxygen. Carbon now has a full set of eight. It's got four bonds around it, each with two electrons, so a full octet, and each oxygen still has a full set of eight. This oxygen that shared now has two shared pairs, so that's actually four electrons in bond situation, and two lone pairs, so another four that are not shared, eight total. So everything is happy, and that is an appropriate Lewis structure. Okay, for the NO plus ion, neither nitrogen or oxygen has their full set of eight. So they're gonna have to share their lone pairs. And probably the easiest thing in this scenario to do is for each nitrogen and oxygen to share one lone pair. So nitrogen will share one, oxygen will share one, and what we end up with is actually a triple bond. Now, each nitrogen and oxygen, they're both happy. Nitrogen has uh, six shared in the triple bond, plus it's one lone pair, so that's eight total. And oxygen has the same scenario, the six that are shared, plus the two that are in a lone pair, that gives us eight total. So this is an appropriate Lewis structure. Okay, um, for the oxygen difluoride, everything has eight. We don't have a need to share anything. Each fluorine has uh, six, as lone pairs and two in the shared bond. And oxygen has two lone pairs and two single bonds. So that's four bonding electrons and eight total. Everything's happy. This is an appropriate Lewis structure. So in summary, in covalently bonded molecules, Lewis structures show how valence electrons are shared between atoms to give each one a full set of eight or two for hydrogen. And generally, the least electronegatives are found at the center of the molecule. More electronegative atoms are found on the outside of the molecule. The one exception is hydrogen, which is always on the outside. Finally, if there are not enough valence electrons to go around and give each atom the full set that it desires, then double and triple bonds form to share more electrons between atoms.